Good afternoon, everyone. I think we should uh, get started since it's 3 o'clock. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Jesse Greener as a WIN seminar speaker this afternoon. Dr. Greener is actually a, a graduate, from, graduate from the chemical physics undergraduate program at the University of Waterloo. He graduated in 1998. And he did his PhD with Peter Norton at the University of Western Ontario on Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy for time resolved measurements at the microsecond time scale. He then took up a postdoctoral fellowship with Professor Eugenia Kumacheva at the University of Toronto, developing uh, microfluidics technology uh, coupled with in situ analytical tools such as FTIR and microelectrodes. Uh, Professor Kumacheva, by the way, is a member of our. International Scientific Advisory Board at WIN. And while uh, he was there, I think one of the last things he did at UFC was he founded a startup company, which is here on this slide at the bottom left, called FlowGem Inc., a microfluidics foundry specializing in custom prototyping of polymer based materials. He was appointed assistant professor of chemistry at Laval in 2012, and his research focuses on biomaterials and microfluidics. Jesse has 37 publications and 28 invited lectures to his credit and was the winner of the 2013 New, Research, New Researcher Award from FRQNT, uh, Quebec's uh, s and agency. So please welcome Jesse Greener, a UW alumnus. And his title, his title is entitled, his title is called Bacterial Biofilm Research Renaissance by Combining Nanoscience and Microfluidics. Jesse. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today. I had a, a great time uh, talking with uh, colleagues uh, over the past two days, meeting with students. Uh, I think you have a very unique facility here that you should all be very proud of. Um, and the work that you're doing is equally strong uh, as the beautiful facility. So congratulations and make the best of it, because not everybody has these facilities uh, at their disposal. So uh, you're very lucky. Um, our group is working with, uh, as was introduced, uh, bacterial biofilms because as I became a new professor, and I hope some people in the audience are thinking about the same sort of tract uh, for the future, for their future, um, it was very important for, for me to develop a new area of research using the skills that I had developed up until that point. And we clearly the work with uh, microfluidics is something that I've um, sort of made a, uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of time spent and a lot of uh, hopefully some nice contributions. But to bring this, what was once a field of study, now becoming more of a tool um, to real a answer real questions that are interesting for other people, we really wanted to find something that's going to benefit from the microflow environment. And so bacterial biofilms which I'll explain a little bit about in a minute, um, presented themselves as a real interesting opportunity. Um, however, having almost no biological uh, experience in terms of studying uh, the systems or even the uh, uh, rooted background from undergrad or grad school, this was a challenging learning curve to, to, to uh, surmount. But uh, I feel very rewarded by the risk that we took to get into this area. And let me just explain why we decided to apply microfluidics and some of our in situ measurement techniques, including nanoscience based, toward biofilms. So first of all, kind of our lab strategies, or you might even say our, our scientific philosophy, is that uh, we always, almost always are using microfluidics. This gives us really high control over environmental conditions inside the channel, specifically related to hydrodynamic and chemical properties of the uh, growth environment in the case of growing biofilms. We also are very uh, almost religious about the fact that everything we do should be in situ. We don't want to take, we don't do a lot of SEM uh, or anything where we take the material out of the channel because we want to see how the material develops and grows and behaves in real time. This is very important for us. This allows us to do uh, real time passive measurements and we're really really keen to do mapping, chemical mapping, uh, and, the su and such. And then finally, uh, introducing nanoscience into all of this um, brings us some new tools 
to further enhance the processes that we're trying to develop um, and give us new tools for study as well for in situ imaging and chemical uh, sensing. I'll explain more about these in detail as we go through the presentation. Uh, with these together, we're able to address the, the sort of general goal for us, which is to transform uh, environmental bacterial samples, biofilm samples, which are typically considered nuisance, into something functional and useful. And being in the chemistry department, a chemistry department, we're looking at chemical um, reactions ca catalyzed by uh, these materials. So one of the applications is energy applications, energy production, I'll talk about this, and some biomedical applications. So the outline of my talk <clears throat> we'll first focus on what is a biofilm, a bacterial biofilm, their properties, their relevance. Um, then we'll transition into how do we use microfluidics to study biofilms. We'll look at flow templating approach for patterning and looking at growth kinetics. We'll look at video imaging and look at the mechanical properties of these materials. And then for the last part of the talk, we'll introduce some nanoscience, uh, nanoconcepts to help enhance our studies and help enhance the uh, biofilm properties. Uh, this last part, we'll talk about some SIRS imaging. Um, this is enhanced surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy uh, in an imaging format. We'll talk about pH imaging, which is very important from the perspective of the uh, byproducts that are produced by a living biofilm. And we'll talk about electrochemistry, specifically electroactive biofilms and the ability to use these in an energy generating uh, potential. So, biofilms. Um, who has a bit of a biology uh, background, just so I know? Great, nobody, perfect. Just like me when I started. Um, <clears throat> a biofilm is a bacterial biofilm. It consists of bacteria, obviously, and then uh, a bunch of, S stands for substance, extracellular polymeric substance. Uh, it's it's a, a mishmash of long organic molecules. Um, and you can see here a very old picture of a biofilm that's been cleaved. And what you see are the uh, stained bacteria almost floating. And they're, they're actually in place based on this extracellular matrix, which is not stained. So they look like they're just floating, but in fact, they're held rigidly in place by this material. And we're talking about something between 30, a 30-70 split between the living material inside of a biofilm and this extracellular polymeric substance outside of it. Now, biofilms live and exist and thrive at interfaces. Uh, we, in microfluidic channels, are exposing the channel volume to liquid, so the interface would be the, li the liquid and channel wall. But even a liquid uh, water, uh, excuse me, a water or air interface can support uh, biofilms. Uh, air solid surfaces at the, at the uh, International Space Station they have a big problem with biofilms growing on the walls. Okay, and there's no water, obviously, supporting them, but they're, they're, there is an interface that they like. These are uh, viscoelastic materials, so they're very complex liquids. Um, they're heterogeneous. You can see here that uh, with a confocal measurement, they're patchy. They change in space and time. And uh, they're very resistant to toxins and, uh, and detachment. This is the primary role of the biofilm is to provide a shelter for bacteria that would otherwise be floating around sort of uh, naked in the in you know, their environment, and this allows them to find a niche, develop new niches actually, where there, there was not one before. Um, they prefer flow environment and they're highly responsive to shear forces, which is really a nice overlap with, this, with what we can bring with microfluidics. So the, the relevance of biofilms include fundamental biology, ecology questions, medicine, uh, dental health is something that we've looked at quite detailed and we'll talk about this today. I hate to break it to you, but every single person here has biofilms on their teeth right now. This is called plaque. It's completely normal, um, but we can learn a lot about that and dental health from these studies. And uh, our, our goal is uh, looking at environmental remediation and cat catalysis based on functional biofilms. Um, so just a little bit about the microfluidics. Um, what's really great about the technology is that it's quite well developed now. We can make microchannels in, almost, in many, many different materials. It can be elastomeric, like polydimethyl siloxane. It can be thermoplastic materials, all of which can bring new surface um, properties, new bulk properties, uh, so that if we're looking at uh, 
cells that need air exchange, polydimethyl siloxane is great because it's, uh, it's porous uh, to small molecules like O2 and CO2. If we want to have a very you know, uh, isolated environment, we can look at some thermoplastics. Their surface uh, hydrophobic properties are also different. So uh, we um, developed a technique for embossing thermal um, nanoimprint lithography in thermoplastics in 2010, which launched the company in 2011. This is the Flowgem company. Um, and there are, you know, lots of interesting applications from um, um, wells, um, multi-well devices on a chip, which can be filled sequentially like this. Uh, genomic uh, sequencing, which can be done in a device like this, which was featured in Cell, uh, supported by Flowgem. Um, we, just because I was at a, a, a talk, uh, a presentation yesterday on fabrication, I just include a paper here that's been submitted. And it's, it's nice to have an opportunity to, to use uh, the collaboration between Flowgem and, and our, our lab for fundamental research. So here's some n nifty structures that we can produce using the, uh, a modified version of hot embossing called hot intrusion embossing, uh, making functional elements inside the microchannel. So we can have very uh, complex and um, uh, finely tuned features to help aid us in our studies. Um, but at the end of the day, what's really important, as I mentioned, is that we have control of the shear forces in the chemical environment. So uh, here's a, a channel that's supporting a turbulent flow. So the Reynolds number is high. Um, and uh, we can compare that to a laminar flow environment where Reynolds number is low. And this is the kind of flow environment that we have in the, the microfluidic channel, which allows us to really finely control what's happening uh, in terms of the forces that are applied to the biofilms that are growing. So we have a laminar flow, high control of shear forces, control over mass transfer, the ability to control morphology of the biofilm. I'll explain more about that soon. The, the bacteria that are initially in the swimming phase easily and quickly find their way to the surface because, uh, so we call it fast startup, because the volume of liquid compared to the surface area ratio is quite uh, small. And um, a very good optical accessibility and the ability to observe and manipulate fundamental properties. So optical microscopy has been a, a really important tool for studying things inside of microchannels, but it's not a chemical technique. It's certainly got limitations. It, it obviously has helped propel the, the, the field forward. But if you just look at <clears throat> the, uh, the types of analytical tools that have been implemented on chip, um, this is confocal microscopy. This is regular transmission microscopy. This is fluorescence microscopy. This is video imaging based on me uh, optical measurements. So uh, maybe 75% of all the tools that are used for microfluidics is, uh, are based in optical uh, microscopy. So we are trying to you know, expand the, the range of, of options for electrochemical, for, um, uh, for analytical measurements. So we're looking at chemical measurements, chemical imaging, and also video uh, imaging, which is uh, for, for novel applications. And here's a list of some of the uh, other approaches that we're using in our lab. So I'm going to talk today about, uh, first of all, a little bit about the just use of microfluidics with standard uh, um, uh, optical measurements and or video measurements to get uh, uh, information about dynamic processes that are happening to biofilms as we subject them to different uh, environments. So, the mechanical properties of the uh, biofilm and the uh, curious formations. In fact, I'm going to start with curious formations because I want to show some movies and give you a sense of what we see in our microscopes every day. So I don't know if I'll be able to run this with, no. So I'm just going to go to my computer. Here's a, here's a time-lapse video of a biofilm starting from nothing, growing in the microchannel. You can see that they, uh, individual colonies grow, they begin to move downstream with the flow of the liquid, um, and then they kind of s become static. And this is very typical. We get a, a thicker growth in the corners compared to the middle. I'll talk about that soon. And what we uh, are able to do, what we started with, was just to understand how do these, uh, how do these um, movements correlate to some of the properties of a biofilm. So we did some tracking uh, of the movement of these uh, structures. This is, um, you know, I think in, in most cases we're dealing with hundreds of these tracked biofilms. We get a lot of statistics. And then from this, we basically follow the movement of the biofilm. Uh, we fit it to a, a mathematical model that's describing viscous flow of two liquids, one against the other. 
Um, and a very simple model allows us to transform these velocity profiles that we see. So if you actually plotted the velocity of those moving tracks in time, you would see that they typically accelerate, they hit a peak, and then they stop. Um, and so this is to us, we said, well, this must be something changing with the mechanical properties of the biofilm. They must be becoming more viscous. So we applied our model. Uh, and based on the different concentrations of salt in the, in the liquid, we transformed that to, to a viscosity. Um, and we, we coupled this with some confocal measurements to make sure that we had the, the right uh, three-dimensional properties of these biofilms. Um, <clears throat> With this approach, we were able to uncover or decipher the behavior of the biofilm in time. What we noticed was as the biofilm grows in time, uh, this, is a, um, this is a movie based on the one I just showed you actually, where we take a, an image as a background at a certain time, say 42 hours I believe, and then uh, we just subtracted that from all the images going forward, and so we see a difference, basically a difference movie, a, uh, the difference between 42 hours and what came after. And these dark spots show uh, biofilm protrusions that are coming off of uh, pillars, biofilm pillars, in the, in the channel, something maybe like this in a very basic way. And we basically have some sort of a partial detachment, and these are streamers that are forming. And streamers are very interesting from the perspective of uh, uh, the morphological behavior of the biofilms in different situations. And what we could finally do is say, okay, these streamers are coming at this point in time um, for you know, around 50 hours. And we could see that this occurred after the biofilm had reached some kind of stable mechanical, stable high viscosity property. Um, we are able to see very cool formations like uh, the growth of so-called streamers, as I mentioned. Uh, from the sidewall, the vertical sidewall of the microchannel. So you can see here a, a streamer is forming. We're looking down on the wall here. And um, as this grows in time, it just moves out of the field of view. Um, streamers rolling biofilms, much like a macrophage in the, in the bloodstream, rolling along the wall here, depositing materials, picking up materials, becoming ejected from the surface. We see these all the time. So from a fundamental biology perspective, we can actually uh, uh, just monitor, watch in time, and learn about what's going on with, the, with these materials. We can track in an analytical way, a quantitative way, you know, the velocity in time of these rolling biofilms, for example. We can look at, you know, we're comparing these two types of formations and we can see their growth properties are similar even though their dynamic interaction with their environment is different. So this is all very interesting um, to us but the problem is that the biofilm is kind of out of mind of its own. You know we want to control the environment but it wants to also control the environment. So what you can see here is some work uh, typically we always see a buildup in the corners and if this is allowed it can actually constrain the channel volume, which then undermines our advantage of having a strict control over hydrodynamics because now the biofilm is pinching off the channel and as the width of the channel goes down in time, this is not our work, this is uh, from uh, colleagues in Korea, um, we can see that the, the back pressure the, goes up and that the hydrodynamic shear stress in, kind of exponentially increases. So we lose our control. Uh, Howard Stone at Princeton showed the, uh, the formation of these streamers uh, in the middle of the channels, unlike us, we showed these at the wall of the channel, and these have a huge impact on the, the hydrodynamic properties in the channels as well. So if we want to apply our technology to study biofilms and to develop them and make them functional for certain um, applications, we have to control this property or else it's going to control us. Uh, just to show some other weird and wonderful behavior, here's a microchannel. If we look at the wall here and we study the growth uh, of the uh, optical density, which is a measure of the biomass of the, of, the, of the biofilm. And we monitor that in time, optical density versus time. We can see that right at the wall, uh, we have a rapid uh, increase in the optical density. The biofilm is growing quickly. If we look away from the wall, this, uh, the kinetics, the growth kinetics reduce. They become diminished. So the proximity to the wall has a big effect on the uh, activity of the biofilm, the growth of the biofilm. 
Um, lots of other weird things I won't have time to talk about today, but uh, just to say that it's, the surface very much affects the behavior of the biofilm. Um, the, the sort of underlying issue here is that in a microchannel, as with any pipe basically, your flow is most rapid in the middle and in the corners or against the surface, it basically the, you know, it's a, we assume it's a zero, zero velocity. But in the case that it's in the corner, you can see that this, this sort of dead region is much more voluminous. There's more, more of this liquid, static liquid here than there is in the middle. So the static, uh, the shear rate, which is a uh, measurement of the difference between the velocity, basically the velocity gradient, the shear stress, the shear rate is much stronger here compared to here. So if we want to, uh, uh, if our goal is to apply a constant shear stress, we not only have to eliminate all of these weird structures, these streamers, these rollers, this, this uh, channel crowding, we also have to uh, ensure that we grow our biofilm in, the, in this location here where the shear is more or less constant. So uh, microfluidics to the rescue, we have a two-phase flow environment. The blue channel is bringing nutrient solution in, and it's, uh, if we look down, it's, it's contained to the middle of the channel. If we look from the side, it's contained to the top wall of the channel. And the red is the confinement solution. So we just uh, rig it up so that the red doesn't support uh, biofilm growth, and the blue does. We have nice laminar flow uh, templating method, and we, we can change, we can tune the size of these, uh, these templating liquid streams based on the flow rate ratio of the confinement stream to the template stream. Um, and we can optimize that. And then at the end of the day, we can inoculate. These are bacteria flowing down the middle of a channel. And then they eventually grow exactly in the middle of a channel. So we avoid these, uh, the corners. And we can uh, now just study the effect of shear directly on the biofilm. The trick here is that the confinement of the biofilm or the this, this solution, template solution in the middle is based on the ratio, the flow rate ratio of the confinement solution to the, the template solution, okay? Um, well, we can achieve this ratio in a number of different ways. So if we multiply each flow rate by 10, we have the same ratio, but the overall flow velocity is increased. So we can change the shear rate, but we can deposit the biofilm exactly in the same place. And so we did kinetic studies just to show that uh, indeed we can maintain the biofilm in the same place, but with this change of shear stress, we can observe the growth kinetics of the biofilm um, that are different. Uh, both the growth kinetics, which are represented by the uh, slope of this optical density versus timeline, also the lag phase, I'll just show here. The lag phase is the time between uh, inoculation and the growth of the biofilm measured quantitatively by optical density. And the slope uh, here is giving us information about the growth kinetics. So here we have a nice way to control all of this, have reproducible results, and um, um, allow us to continue our studies. We've had, you know, I won't go into this too much more because I want to get to the nano uh, measurements uh, shortly, but we can, we can further uh, uh, make this more complex where we can have two inlet solutions, one template on top of the other, and now we can control where we do the inoculation and where we provide the nutrient solution so that we don't have back growth. You can see here there's a little bit of back growth uh, in the tubing that's connected to the device, which will start to consume uh, the material that we're providing to the biofilm unless we isolate this after the inoculation and provide the nutrient solution from here. Now there's no back growth and we know exactly the conditions of the chemicals conditions in the channel at the time that this liquid stream first touches the biofilm. So now we have a nice system to do real quantitative measurements, control the biofilm and see how it reacts to different environments. Um, <clears throat> so then I want to get to the more sophisticated applications of biofilm studies in microchannels. Um, there's, I'll, I'll talk about today three different, uh, different experiments, different directions of our lab related to 
Raman spectroscopy, so surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, which relies on nanostructured metal surfaces to provide a plasmonic enhancement. Um, pH sensing is quite important for these biomaterials for all of our applications. So a plasmonic enhanced pH sensor embedded into the microchannel to provide in situ measurements is also presented. And then uh, nanobio hybrid materials to enhance the properties of the biofilms that we're developing for the applications of microbial fuel cells, energy production. And then I'll leave off with a little bit of next steps. So um, I assume most people here are familiar with surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. Anybody familiar with it? Okay, not that familiar. Uh, this is a tool to allow for enhanced signal by, based on the localized enhancement of plasmonic um, um, properties of a metal. So basically we irradiate a, a metal surface, the, the properties, the, the metal surface will respond at certain frequencies to uh, the driving electro, electric field uh, hitting the surface and this will drive oscillations in the electrons at the surface and create local enhancements of the field at the surface which can then be used for spectroscopic, uh, sensitive spectroscopic measurements. So we developed a very simple technique to give us this capability in a microchannel. We have a, a very similar setup as before, a two-channel, uh, two-level microfluidic device, one bringing the confinement solution, one bringing a template solution. But before we actually run the experiment, we take our channel and we coat it with a silver layer. Silver um, being provided by a so-called mirror reaction or electrolysis deposition. Um, we're reducing the silver uh, ions in solution and they fall and find their, the surface and coat the surface. Very simple uh, technique to give us this layer. And then, uh, and, uh, and this is the device that we used. This is a key issue for spectroscopy. Why? First, we can get enhanced um, signal. But if you can imagine the device here, Here's the device, if we shine, so Raman spectroscopy uses a laser beam, a uh, very intense laser that hits the surface or hits a, your analyte and backscattered light um, coming from inelastic uh, collisions which, with the light and the, uh, and the materials which, which can backscatter, uh, these come back to the detector and we can get a spectroscopic signal based on, uh, on what we see. But, you can imagine a microchannel where this is a very small volume of liquid. Uh, the, the interaction between this liquid and the laser beam coming down compared to the interaction of the laser beam and all the material below, all this, this material for our, our device, is going to be basically overwhelmed. This is going to give, provide a very small contribution to the signal. So this metal layer actually being reflective, of course, uh, and, and blocking the underlying material from the light, the laser light, actually serves a really functional purpose of just confining the laser light to the channel. In addition, um, and that's what we show here, but I won't go into the details, but basically we get a much cleaner signal instead of this bumpy curve here, um, which is a contribution of both the material of the microfluidic device and the analyte at the same time, we can see just uh, specifically, you know, the analyte of interest. Uh, this is a big swooping background from water, which we always see. But you can see now we at least can get the peaks very re well resolved. Simply applying a, a regular plasma in a, in a plasma cleaner, air plasma, on the silver nanosurf, on the silver surface, tends to create a nanostructured surface. I didn't show the AFM uh, measurements here, but I did show the spectroscopic images, which show an absorbance uh, increase in the um, in the, the surface after different times of plasma treatment. And if we shine a laser here at this frequency, we can see that the absorption finally after uh, a certain amount of time, this green curve, we can see that the uh, Raman intensity goes up, okay? If we, because this is proof of principle, we didn't optimize the system, but if we then irradiate it with a, a laser beam, you know, at this frequency, 400 nanometers, for example, or around that, we would get a much higher uh, Raman intensity enhancement. 
But the, the point is, after this, we can simply do a, a calibration curve. So we, we put in an analyte at different known concentrations. We can measure the, the intensity of the band that's associated with that analyte. And we can see that it grows linearly in time, as it should. So we can then use this as a calibration method to give us information about what's actually happening in the microchannel. So then finally, just to show, uh, here's a liquid coming out of the hole in the microchannel, which is uh, here. And we scan across, and we can see the profile of the solution, the different solution that's coming through. And we grew biofilms. Uh, applied precursor materials, and we could do spectroscopic measurements and, and mapping measurements uh, inside of the microchannel. The, <clears throat> the next um, nano kind of inspired work that we did, um, this is a very recent work actually, was to look at dental oral biofilms. So here's a classic, uh, what's called a Stefan curve. Dental students learn about this. Um, and they don't understand it, but they, they know empirically that when you eat something sugary, actually any, any snack, any food, what happens is after you consume that, the bacteria in your mouth uh, will break down to some degree that uh, the food nutritious, uh, uh, nutrition sources and produce a, a lactic acid, these are called lactic acid bacteria, they'll produce an acidic by, uh, 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 byproduct and you'll get a very rapid decrease in the pH. This is universal. And then if you wait in time, you can see that it slowly grows back up to sort of safe conditions. Um, and depending on the duration that this curve stays below a critical value of around 5.3 pH units, and of course how, how acidic it gets, if we basically take the integration of this, this uh, overlap of these, this box and this curve, we can talk about um, we can talk about how damaging the biofilm or how damaging these, these acid environments are to the demineralization of our teeth. And I don't know if I, I hope I, I didn't, uh, I have the equation somewhere. I'll, I'll refer to the equation that talks about the breakdown of the, this uh, material soon. So um, what we wanted to do, this, t this curve in practice is taken um, by literally spraying someone's mouth with a, a sugar solution, and then picking off a piece of the, the plaque off their teeth and making measurements offline every period of time, every so, every so often. Or you could submerse uh, you know, this, uh, a model tooth into an environment and watch how it acidifies its environment. Uh, either way, very indirect measurements, and this is a very qualitative profile that's been generated up to date, even though it's so fundamental to dentistry uh, students and to the, the field of study. So we developed in collaboration with the Boudreau group in our uh, department, nanoparticles that are core uh, shell. The core is a, is a silver uh, core, which is, uh, once again, as, uh, this, uh, along the same mechanisms I, I explained before, plasmonic in the sense that it will absorb light and cause oscillations in the uh, electron cloud that's surrounding the, uh, the metal and cause a locally enhanced field at the surface. At the surface, co-localized is a silica shell with fluorescein molecules embedded inside of it. This silica shell is porous to uh, protons so that if the pH environment changes, they will become subjected to different pH environments. It just so happens that this fluorophore and others are sensitive, uh, their optical properties are sensitive to the pH environment. So for example, if we do an excitation, we can excite the, uh, the uh, uh, fluorescein at different positions. If we excite here, no matter what the pH is, the intensity on the emission side is the same. If we excite here <clears throat> uh, and we change the pH, we can see that the fluorescein uh, absorption cross-section changes, okay, which affects then uh, the output in terms of the luminosity. So these, are, these uh, molecules are, are pH dependent and they can be sensors for uh, the, the pH environment, but we enhance very, very much the sensitivity thanks to this metal core. Okay, so it's about a, a 20, 15 times enhancement of the signal thanks to these core. 
In addition, the core provides many other benefits. The photo bleaching of the fluorophore is much, much reduced. This is always a big problem when you're trying to use, a, uh, when you're irradiating a fluorophore in time, you're gonna have photo damage due to oxidation of that uh, molecule. But uh, that's because, well, I won't get into the, too much into the photochemistry, but the excitation time is far reduced because of the quenching between the fluorophore and this close proximity of the metal structure. Um, <clears throat> So this is a, a really Im, uh, important advancement as well in terms of the robustness of the detection system. Uh, following a simple click chemistry, we can also functionalize the shell of the nanostructure uh, such that it then interacts with a glass slide which has also been uh, uh, functionalized with a receptor group. And we can click these into place so they stick to the surface very well. Uh, so here's a, a SEM of the uh, nanoparticles sticking to the surface. Uh, a little bit, uh, more or less a monolayer, but a little bit patchy. But thanks to the fact that we have ratiometric measurements, that is we can compare the uh, intensity of the light coming out when we irradiate at one frequency compared to the light coming out when we irradiate at a second frequency. Um, if we have a local change in density of the, of the material, this ratiometric approach eliminates uh, kind of uh, overestimations of the signal because of the crowding of uh, sensors here compared to here, for example. Very important uh, uh, robust tech, uh, uh, very important um, property to make this a very robust technique. Then we use a standard photolithographic approach, uh, excuse me, a, a soft lithographic approach where we just selectively remove the, the nanoparticles from the coated glass slide. So we just put a, we put a PDMS device down with the same dimension, channel dimensions, as we will use in the experiment. They stick, the nanoparticles will preferentially uh, stick to the PDMS, um, um, and then we can lift that off, and then bring a new clean device down on top of the pattern that's left behind, and we have this perfectly suited uh, dimensional, uh, perfectly dimensionally suited uh, channel sensor uh, to our channel. Um, now we can image what would normally just be a, a, a very invisible uh, two streams of liquid, but now because this, the pH sensing properties, we can actually see in the microchannel um, the different uh, pH environments. Uh, we've used this also for carbon dioxide bubbles, uh, which will locally acidify water um, in the vicinity. And most importantly for us is we use this to study biofilms. So here's a, um, I'll just skip to here. Here's the classic Stefan curve. We want to, we want to mimic and start to understand the, me the mechanisms behind this production of this sort of behavior of this curve. So we eat a hamburger and we want to see what happens to the, the acid in our, against our teeth, which is the important part with, with respect to tooth decay. So for example here, you can see at this point here, um, we have a relatively neutral pH value. We apply a glucose solution and we get a rapid decrease in the pH at the surface between the biofilm and the, the supporting uh, uh, wall, which is the tooth surface in our, in our model. Um, this is all controlled inside the microchannel, so we can, also, we can cycle between glucose, non-glucose, and we can see how these uh, bacteria respond um, we can also, personally, because I, I love the manipulation of the hydrodynamic environment, we can also see what is the response, what is the role of flow and mass transfer, basically flow-enhanced mass transfer of molecules, byproducts, from the biofilm to the exterior based on um, just washing with a higher shear force applied. So, uh, and this is one of the, this is assumed to be one of the major reasons that we have this recovery is that we have constant motion of saliva in our mouths, which is helping to wash out the, uh, the, bio, uh, the, the byproducts from the, from the lactic acid bacteria. So we can see here, this, is, this says 3.5, so at a moderate flow value producing um, a shear stress that's moderate shear stress against the biofilm, uh, we can have a certain value of pH near seven, for example. And then if we turn the flow off and all of a sudden the shear stress is zero, we have a buildup of these uh, acidic molecules at the interface between 
the uh, biofilm in the surface. So the, the, the acidification process happens. We can turn the flow back on at a higher value this time, giving us a higher shear stress. We can see that the, uh, the value of pH goes even higher than it was before. We can transform this into a concentration based on some simple chemical equations. So we now know the concentration of these um, molecules inside of the biofilm. And this, is, this now gives us a handle and a tool to study uh, biofilm um, uh, effect on our oral health. Uh, I'm going to skip this uh, in the interest of time, but just to say that uh, here's the equation I talked about. I won't go into this at all, but uh, it is important to say that as we, this is the, this is hydroxyapatite, which is one of the minerals in our teeth forming the enamel, and it can break down and uh, form ions if we apply an acid, um, and we can actually demineralize, that is to take out the calcium from our teeth. Uh, this is why we apply fluoride every day and when we brush our teeth and we have it in our water is because we replace the calcium with the fluoride and this becomes less susceptible to this uh, reaction in an acidified environment. Um, <clears throat> so our next steps with this work is to use infrared spectroscopy on a ATR crystal attenuated total reflection uh, FTIR and actually to look at the chemical, uh, uh, look at what's happening to the chemical properties so we can actually isolate um, the, the hydroxyapatite by, we can identify it by this phosphate group and as the uh, biofilm acidifies the tooth uh, and we demineralize the tooth, we also lose these phosphate groups as the enamel uh, goes away and we can see that based on the pH we do have uh, different um, slopes in terms of the loss, the rate of loss of this material from our teeth. Um, and we can do this by, this is uh, from A, simply applying a certain pH liquid to the, to the hydroxyapatite on the, on the ATR crystal, and B, growing a real biofilm and watching it reduce the concentration of this important mineral by itself. And we can see that if we apply the same pH uh, liquid to the uh, enamel, as the biofilm produces naturally, as it uh, acidifies this environment, we get the same reduction in the... Um, in the absorbance, which is an indication of the material that's being lost uh, due to this uh, process. Um, <clears throat> lastly, I want to talk about our kind of uh, bedrock uh, area of, of research, which is complex, and you know we're really moving um, methodically through this uh, area of research. It's uh, it's uh, bio uh, fuel cells by microbial fuel cell approach. What happens is we you, and this is not. This is a, a developing area. Many people are working on this. You can add a biofilm to an electrode. You can um, pass uh, a sucrose solution or some organic molecule, acetate, for example. The biofilm will break down this uh, molecule based on an uh, oxidation process, uh, producing protons, producing carbon dioxide, small fragments of the original molecule, uh, and most importantly, electrons. So, for example, uh, sucrose will produce 48 electrons per molecule. Acetate will produce 8 electrons per molecule. Those go to the other side, uh, the cathode, where they recombine with oxygen, or we might have some ferrocyanide in the other, an electron receptor up here, and the electrons eventually make their way through an external circuit and come back and help to uh, form this uh, cathodic reaction. So, we do this in a microchannel, and we do this in bulk. In our microchannel experiments, we have a, a device like this with embedded electrodes connected to a potentiostat so we can do electrochemical, uh, in situ electrochemical measurements. Before I got to Laval, uh, we had never done electrochem, I'd never done electrochemistry, but thanks to some great students and the hard work, we're now doing, I would say, fairly sophisticated work. We can uh, look at, uh, here's a, a little curve of uh, the intensity, elect the electron production or the current versus time. And uh, if we just look at it, you know, at, at one point here at the top, for example, we can see that if we change the flow rate, so we go from one flow rate to a higher flow rate, we see little jumps. Uh, we can go back to our original flow rate, it goes back down, the current goes back down. We increase the flow rate even higher, it goes back up even higher. So we can, in real time, once again, hydrodynamic conditions can control how the, bi the biofilm behaves. We can shut off the, the nutrient solution and all of a sudden the electron Current production it goes to zero. We can turn it back on, on, off. So this is the control aspect. Um, so, uh, and what's really nice is the biofilm only in this case will grow against the electrode because it needs that electrode 
to breathe, basically. Part of its metabolism is, is based on getting rid of electrons through the, uh, its metabol metabolism cycle. Uh, so it won't grow anywhere else in the channel, so we don't have to do any complicated microfluidic uh, manipulations like I showed you before. Um, and we can have real uh, interesting um, measurements about the pH. I won't go into detail, but using cyclic voltammetry, we can see where certain, anybody use cyclic voltammetry? A little bit, great, a little bit. I won't go into detail here, but I will just say that this peak is related to uh, the, the, a, redo a redox reaction of a certain molecule, certain types of proteins on the bacteria, cytochrome proteins. Uh, they can be oxidized or reduced. Uh, because this is evolving a, um, a hydrogen atom or hydrogen um, a proton, we can predict exactly through the NERSC equation uh, how this peak should shift under different pH environments. And uh, with a calibration curve, we can, rele we can realize, uh, uh, we can transform this difference in the peak position to a pH at the electrode surface. Very, very important for production of electricity because this is one of the major limitations, the localized acidification of the biofilm. Lastly, I want to say that we're now integrating uh, nanomaterials inside the biofilm so that we can enhance the conductivity. We want to modify the biofilm's core properties. Um, a lot of people focus on modifying the electrode to give it higher surface area to whatever, uh, have more conductive material. We want to contribute by changing the biofilm itself. And just to say that uh, these two curves here show the preliminary results from incorporation of carbon nanotubes into the biofilm. Uh, originally a, a bit of a slow growth, but then it rapidly takes off. And we look at the power density coming off of this biofilm. I won't go into the, the measurement technique unless people are interested, but basically this curve is thanks to a biofilm inoculated with or in, in, uh, containing carbon nanotubes, whereas this is the biofilm power production from a, a, a native uh, material. And we're looking now at how this change, how this affects the growth patterns of the biofilm. So uh, we see a lot more viable uh, bacteria further from the electrode surface, thanks to the fact that they're more electrically wired to the surface than the ones that uh, were not. And so this is a very important results and we're just uh, finalizing these data now. I'm gonna leave this now, but just to say we've also really interested in system level uh, imaging using um, uh, electrochemical imaging through an array of electrodes serving, serving as pixels. We can produce very nice images. Uh, we call it system level because we bring together electronics, the microfluidics and the software uh, into a package um, with an interface and everything so that it's, it's very repeatable. And, and uh, easy to use. Uh, with that, I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you for your attention. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, we're from uh, Quebec City. The beautiful city of Quebec City is where Laval University is. Uh, you can see that the vistas here are quite stunning, whether it's in the summer or in the winter. Uh, you can see the people are quite spirited. Um, there's no doubt about that. And I hope you agree that uh, the research is very interesting as well. So with that, I'll thank you very much and take your questions. would love to. Um, I kept this a little bit short, but um, so what do we have here? Uh, we have a, uh, I didn't include a lot of details, but um, this is a PCB based uh, electrode array. Um, we used a four layer, uh, are you familiar with PCB? Anybody familiar with electrode arrays in general? Okay, you, seem to know, you basically you should be in our group. <laughs> you seem to know everything. Um, so uh, PCB, printed circuit boards, that's what's on your side of your computer, these green boards. Uh, they have embedded leads, uh, electrical leads. And if you want, you can expose parts of the, um, uh, you can expose the, an electrode in this case. So we can have custom printed boards with fairly good resolution. I mean, these aren't, you know, uh, these are maybe 200 micron by 200 micron squares that can go lower. Um, and they're fairly high density. And they can be individually, uh, accessed through a, a, a connector. I don't show the picture here, but basically on either side of the board, there's many, many pins. 
and we have a connector that just connects to that. And it goes to custom um, uh, control electronics. This includes a multiplexer, so we can, uh, we can tell the, the system can interrogate this, uh, uh, electrode interrogate this one sequentially. Um, it consists of some you know, uh, control hardware as well. And most importantly, it consists of a, a potential stat. And the potential stat is what drives the communication between the, uh, with the, the multiplexer. And then basically we're doing uh, cyclic voltammetry sequentially, point by point. Um, and I didn't show too much. Uh, there's, we, have, we can make movies um, by uh, changing the, you know, we can change. This is, again, using our kind of not patented, but uh, go-to method where we're using a flow confinement. So we've got uh, this uh, confining liquid here, which is not electrically active uh, material. We have a redox uh, ferrous cyanide uh, solution in the middle. And this is confined uh, uh, in the microchannel. So we can change these flow parameters based on these inputs and position um, the, uh, the stream wherever we want. So we can make movies where we see this moving back and forth. And the goal actually is then to start to study uh, 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 spatial arrangements of electroactive bacteria. And uh, is this uh, an array of uh, electrodes? Is this uh, simultaneously or just uh, one by one? Good. Um, <clears throat> currently, it's simply a multiplexer. So we individually, sequentially ac uh, address every electrode. So this takes some time. Um, we optimize it so we can get a mi an image every two minutes. But uh, the way to go is to parallel measurements. These bring in some electrical engineering aspects because driving multiple electrodes near each other with a CV uh, that could create some interference. So we've got collaborations with electrical engineers to properly devise a, potenti a, pot a potentiometer that will do this multi-channel and, and limit the interference between the pixels. So what do you see the potential of these um of these biofuel cells for, uh, I mean, what, what applications are you going to be putting, putting in into use? I have to say that I'm, I'm extremely uh, motivated by this area because uh, these can, in theory and now close to in practice, produce electricity from, literally from toilet water. Mm -hmm. So they're being, um, uh, the lead, one of the lead groups, um, uh, Logan's group in um, Ohio State, I think. They are now in their third generation of bulk systems. We're playing on a micro level because we want to optimize you know, the conditions and, and program the bacteria, the biofilms with new materials. But you know, on the engineering side, it's, it's quite well advanced. And um, they've optimized the electrode sp uh, spacing. They've optimized you know, volumes. And they're going from literally out of the septic tank to 100% clean and produce energy from that at the same time. These are very exciting potential. Even if you can just personally, I mean, they're really going for the moon. They want to they fully clean the water. There's filtration and, and these kinds of things. But once you get the dissolved organics only, a solution of dissolved organics, they want to go from that to fully clean and produce electricity. And the amount of energy that we spend right now to clean the water for example, in the States, is between 2 to 5%, depending on the, the location. 2 to 5% of their entire energy budget is, is going to wastewater maintenance. The theoretical amount of energy that could be recovered from the, the biological or, or the organic materials that are in the wastewater is uh, 10 times that. So going from you know, spending 5% of your energy budget on cleaning water to producing 50% of energy for you know other things is a great great challenge, and it's uh, we're, we're very happy to play a small role in all this. But uh, currently, no one's doing this, so there's a really great window of you know when you focus on the the details as opposed to the engineering. But there's a lot of room for even more optimization. We think. So is fouling of the of the surface is not a problem? Well, I mean, we like the fouling because this is the. Uh, you know, there's kind of an evolutionary process going on. If you give the biofilm the right environment, that is the ability to take away its electrons and help its respiration increase, it will grow and thrive. And for those uh, uh, bacteria that don't thrive in that environment, they'll be sort of squeezed out. So, you know, what people actually really, literally, they, they go to a bog, they take, they take the water there, 
They put it in their uh, microbial fuel cell, they connect it, and the power will be low. And eventually, as generations of bacteria grow, and some die, and the ones that like it thrive, they ramp up. And they, it's, you'll look at the percentage of the bacteria that are in the inoculant or that are in the in the system after maybe a week or two weeks. It's the ones you want. So it's it's kind of ideal. Not to oversell it, but this could be quite a quite a great area. Any other questions? If not, then please join me in thanking Jesse for a very interesting talk. Thank you.